This is the second time that we hear the story of Peter and Cornelius. I don't know if you've noticed that in the chapter before, we hear the account as it takes place. And now then we hear the same account as Peter recounts what happened to him uh, by, uh, in order to just set them at ease about what had taken place. Because they were upset. They were just like him. They thought that it was wrong for a good Jewish boy to even set foot or fraternize with or socialize with a Gentile. And so Peter explains this. Whenever something is mentioned twice in the Bible, you know it's something you need to be looking at. Now look, the, in the, the Gospels, we have a lot of stories that are actually repeated four times. And so we know those are really underscored by the Lord, don't we? Some three times. But here we have, there are some stories in the Old Testament that appear twice. But those things that the Lord deems worthy of repeating, we need to pay attention to. And so I want us to be looking at what happened here uh, today and then probably we'll continue on with this this next week. Now, the main message is that sometimes we can get stuck in ruts. We can get stuck and think that we're right where we ought to be when we're not at all. Uh, a parable from life that kind of uh, uh, exemplifies everything we're talking about here, I think, is a story I read recently about a young man who was hauling a load of hay on a wagon, and his wagon hit the rut wrong, and it tipped over. And his wagon was stuck. And he was there, stuck in the road, and was walking around, looking at this turned over wagon full of hay. When a, a farmer that lived nearby saw the dilemma and came out and said, what's going on? He said, oh man, my wagon stuck here and I've got to, I've got to get it turned back up. He said, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you just forget about your troubles for a while? Come on, have dinner with us, and then I'll help you get your wagon straightened back up. He said, well, that sounds good, but I just don't think my daddy would appreciate that much. And he said, oh, come on, your dad's not going to mind. Come on, you need to eat. He said, okay, but I don't think dad's going to like it. So uh, he went on with the farmer and he ate. And uh, after it was over, he uh, said, that was a real good meal, and I thank you for it, but I really don't think my daddy's going to be happy about this at all. And uh, I need to go get that wagon turned over. He said, okay, well, come on, I'll go with you, and I'll help you. Where is your dad, by the way? He said, he's under the wagon. <laughs> the thing is, Peter was stuck in a rut that was going to keep him from going to Cornelius and sharing the good news of the gospel with Cornelius. And so Peter's like the boy. Cornelius is like the man that was stuck under the wagon. Sometimes when we get stuck in ruts, you see, we wind up affecting more people. It affects us but it also affects others as well. And so I want us to look at this and look at Peter and uh, just see what's going on here. You see, Peter had to unlearn something that was going to keep him from carrying out the mission that the Lord had for him to do. And it was going to keep him from the fullness of life that God had for him. In this particular case, it was living out of tradition instead of God's word and God's will that was going to cause him to, whenever these guys knocked on the front door, to say, sorry, we don't associate with you guys. But because uh, Peter uh, handled things the way he did, the Gentiles began to hear the gospel. 
I looked and I double checked and not eating or having anything to do with Gentiles was really not a part of the Old Testament law. You know, he, Peter tells them that it, was, it wasn't lawful. But the thing is, it's not written in the law. It's something that began as something good. The whole idea of steering clear of eating with Gentiles or having anything to do with them was to maintain ceremonial purity. But whenever you're maintaining purity in a ceremonial way, keeps you from relating to people, then something has gone wrong. And so here, Peter has been brought up, he has been taught, good Jewish boys do not do this. And so whenever the Lord says, do this, he tells the Lord, no. His first response is, no, I've never gone against what you want me to do. And so the Lord has to tell him, what I've made clean is clean. And that is enough. The Lord knows exactly what sort of a two before to whack us up the side of the head with, doesn't he? And that's what it takes for me a lot of times is just a good whack up side of the head with a two before to get me back on track and moving in the right direction. You know, the Christian walk is, uh, is different than a lot of other things. I was just looking at it this morning. It's kind of like it's, you could compare the Christian walk to an airplane as opposed to a train or a ship or a bicycle or anything like that or an automobile. You know, if, uh, if you're driving along in an automobile, you can slow down and stop. If you cut off the engine, you're just going to stop and that'll be it. Uh, if you're in a ship, you can stop. And uh, anyway, and you a bicycle, you can stop. You stop an airplane, it's going to fall. And so uh, the thing is, we are meant to keep moving forward. You remember how Paul said, forgetting what lies behind, I press on toward the high calling of Christ Jesus, our Lord. I press on. We, there's no place to get stuck. Now, you know, ruts can be brought about by something good and by something practical, but then all of a sudden wind up not being. I just learned yesterday about why railroad tracks are the width that they are. Have you ever noticed that? All railroad, the standard gauge for a railroad track is four feet, eight and a half inches. Isn't that an odd measurement? Four feet, eight and a half inches. Now, why are all, why is that the standard for United States Railroad? Because the first guy that built rail, people that built railroads here had come over from England. And that's the width that they made them in England. And uh, they made that they were making them that width because that was the width of the tram rails before uh, railroad car, railroads came along. And the trams, they just carried their tools and all over to make the same width. Now then, the tram rails were that width because before there were trams, there were wagons. And the wagons, the width between the wagon wheels was four feet, eight and a half inches wide. Now, why was that? I mean, that's what all the tools were geared for. So this brought the wagon making tools over to make trams, tram making tools over to make railroad things. So why were the uh, wagon wheels four feet, eight and a half inches apart? This because that's what fit the ruts in the roads. And if they didn't make them four feet, eight and a half inches apart, they wouldn't fit in the ruts and the roads in England. Now, where did those ruts come from? They came from the Roman chariots that had, while the, England was a part of the Roman Empire for hundreds and hundreds of years, traveling the lengthy roads, 
Their chariots made those ruts. Now, why were their chariots wheels four feet, eight and a half inches apart? Because that was how far apart the wheels on a chariot had to be to accommodate the width of two war horses' backsides. And that's where the measurement came from. And so here's something that's carried on by tradition that just began with how wide a horse's backside was. That's just how it got started. And we've been stuck with it for thousands of years. It's just amazing. It's so easy to get stuck in a rut. But the thing is, we aren't meant to be stuck in ruts. We miss out. And this is just it. As we move on with the Lord, we discover that he progressively pulls back the curtain and helps us see more and more of the life that he has for us. And it may go contrary to what our parents taught us. It may go contrary to what our friends are telling us. But the thing is, he has more life. And as he leads us and we will listen and we will obey, every time we come across one of these things that we stop and say, no, I I shouldn't do that. And yet, you know, the Lord wants you to. Every time you do that, it opens your life up to where there's more life. Satan will try to whisper in your ear and say, you'll die if you let go of that. You'll die if you quit doing things this way and start doing them that way. And yes, you will. You'll die to self and live to God and have more life than you ever had before. One of the biggest conflicts that Jesus had with the scribes and the Pharisees was over their letting tradition keep them from being compassionate and cause them to ostracize and put down people who were actually hungering and thirsting for God. I, uh, I'll give you a modern day example. I know a young man who wound up being transferred to a church that was catty corner across the street from a honky tonk. And it just so happened that his uncle would work there as a DJ from time to time. Now then, as a fine young Methodist preacher, should he even walk on the same side of the street as a honky tonk? Should he go inside a honky-tonk? Well, tradition would say preachers shouldn't have anything to do with that sort of stuff. But this young man didn't listen to tradition. His uncle was right over there. And so he started, whenever he would see his uncle was over there and his aunt was there, he started biddly bopping over there and visiting with them in the honky-tonk. And from that Well, what grew out of that was ultimately that uh, his aunt wound up being the praise leader uh, at his church's contemporary service. That would never have happened if uh, he had not been willing to step across the street and into a honky tonk. But see, this is about the same thing that Peter is faced with. Good Jewish boys don't do this, but God compelled him to. And when he did, new life was before him. And not just for him, but for us Gentiles as well. Now, sometimes our ideas of what God wants from us can be wrong. Sometimes our fears of what God wants from us can be wrong. Sometimes our assumptions about what God wants from us can be wrong. But never will what God tells us be wrong. Now, I want you to notice the subjects in the three statements preceding that. Ideas, fears, and assumptions. 
anytime we're using those to deduce what we're supposed to be doing for God, we're probably going to be on the wrong track. We can't be governed by our ideas, fears, and assumptions. Instead, we have to listen to God and look at his word. Uh, I saw a cartoon the other day where the preacher is standing up there and he read the passage where Jesus says, go sell all you have and give it to the poor and then come follow me. And then the preacher kind of looks there and it's kind of uneasy in the sanctuary. He says, I want to spend the next several minutes explaining why he really didn't mean that. And the whole congregation goes, Phew. but the thing is, whatever God says to do, we're supposed to do it. And God, what God tells us to do is never going to be wrong. If your spiritual conduct is based on the things I just mentioned, instead of God's word and God's will, you're going to be living in spiritual poverty, in bondage, in blindness, and you're going to be living in oppression. I'll give you an example. Uh, many of you know I was a, a modern language major in undergraduate school. My degree is in modern languages. Spanish was my major language. Russian was my backup language. And uh, Czechoslovakian took a little bit of Czechoslovakian. And uh, the thing is, some people say, oh, you're a linguist. No, I'm a polyglot. There's a difference. Uh, now, I took some linguistics courses. Linguistics is the science of language. A good linguist can go into a remote village where the language has never been heard in the outside world and never written down, and within three days be able to carry on a conversation with those people. Because language fits certain patterns because the human heart and the human brain fit certain patterns and you can actually develop formulas for language just because we are not nearly as unique as we want to think that we are but the thing is yeah i spoke several languages and because of that, after the Lord called me uh, to become a pastor and I wound up in seminary, everybody would say, oh, uh, you're going to be going into the mission field. And I say, oh, no, not that. Uh-uh, no. I didn't, I couldn't see living in a mud hut somewhere, you know? I mean, you know, I just, I really didn't even want to think about that. I didn't want to think about taking my kids somewhere where they would get bit by tsetse flies or whatever. You know, I wanted to take care of my family. I wanted to serve the Lord. And so I, in my heart of hearts, would just stick fingers in my ears anytime somebody would start talking about the mission field. Well, from time to time, the Wycliffe Bible translators would come to campus and try to recruit. And if I wound up in a room with a Wycliffe Bible translator recruiter, you would find me plastered on the back corner of the farthest wall from this guy because I didn't want to hear it. I didn't even want to talk to him about it. And so in my heart of hearts, I ran from God, just like Jonah. I was running. And while even while I was studying to be a minister, I was running from God. You can do that. You can be operating on two or three different levels a lot of time in life. And so finally, whenever I was serving my second full time church, I walked up and there was a car parked outside. And you know what? I had no excuses and the young man sitting in that car was a Wycliffe Bible translator. And he had heard about me and he wanted to talk to me about becoming a Wycliffe Bible translator. And you know what? I had no excuses to not listen to him. And so I invited him into my study and I sat down. And I started asking him, he started explaining to me what Wycliffe Bible translators did. 
And all of a sudden, as I listened to him and he told me what they did, it became clear. I wasn't called to be a Wycliffe Bible translator. I was called to be a pastor. I had been running for no good reason. If I had just stopped and addressed the issue, I could have had so much more peace in my heart for multiple years. Sometimes just because we won't face our fears, because we run from them, we wind up in a bad spot. Well, it was such a relief. All of a sudden, this weight was lifted and my mission was much clearer after I got through talking with the Wycliffe Bible translator. Maybe there's some things in your lives that maybe you've been afraid to really even bring them up in a conversation with the Lord because you're afraid of what he might say. Let me tell you, whenever you, there's a place in scripture where Jesus says, which of you, if your son asked you for bread, would you give him a rock? Which of you, if your son asked you for a fish, would you give him a snake? And then he says, if you then be an evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give what's good to you? And I have learned not to run from God. I've learned to just take my concerns to him and not be kept from God and what he has for me in that way. Well, uh, the thing is, I have wound up in my life over and over again, finding myself being freed from things in my past so I can live in the present and look forward to the future. Sometimes it's been bad teaching. Sometimes it's been uh, just traditions of men. But many, many times it's because I just didn't want to consider that. Now, we're running out of time, and so I'll just make it clear to you that just like Peter, we can wind up being held back. Peter was over and over again, just like the children of Israel. Look at the children of Israel. Their whole history is one of following the Lord and then getting caught in a rut and drifting away from God. I mean, they wound up 40 years wandering in the wilderness, stuck because they didn't want to do what they knew the Lord wanted them to do. I often wonder if they had just all come to repentance early, if maybe the Lord would have had mercy on them. But apparently, you never, I never see any place in the scripture where the children of Israel say, okay, we're sorry, we messed up. We'll go fight those guys now. They never do that. They just wander around, stuck, just right across the river from the promised land. And that's the history of Israel over and over again. And it's our history. But sometimes we wind up getting a tap on the shoulder from the Lord. And he says, it's time now for you to move on. Maybe he's tapping you on the shoulder this morning. What could it be? What could it be, I wonder? Uh, it could have something to do with prejudice. It could have something to do with racism. It could have something to do with arrogance or pride. Or maybe you're stuck because of something from your past that you just haven't been able to get over. Maybe it's regret. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's just a lack of trusting God. Maybe it's an addiction. There's no telling what it could be. But let me tell you this. The Lord has more life for you than you're going to find stuck there where you are right now. And if like Peter, you will just take a deep breath and say, okay, Lord, I'm taking this step. He stepped across the threshold into Cornelius's house and found new life. If you'll just take a deep breath and step across the threshold, whatever that threshold might be, he has new life for you. You know, 
Whenever Jesus declared his ministry at the beginning in the fourth chapter of Luke, he made it clear that his purpose in coming was to unstick us whenever we get stuck. Have you ever noticed that? He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to the needy. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set free those are who are oppressed. Can you see that? If you're stuck, even if you don't know it, the Lord wants to help you get unstuck. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.